a healthy number of people in this uh, firebrand sprint as phoebe has said around an introduction to machine learning and i suppose the kind of first point to um to kind of manage expectations is machine learning is an incredibly complex topic an incredibly wide-ranging topic um but we all need to start somewhere and i suppose this is exactly what this sprint has been designed to do um to give you some more knowledge around the basics of machine learning maybe allow you to have more credible conversations in the workplace um maybe it'll help you make a judgment in terms of whether this is a place you want to take your career etc 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 so what are we going to be looking at today what are we going to be well as long as powerpoint sorts itself out and lets me skip on a slide we shall get to that place so um, i think it's important to have a look at the origins of machine learning it's really important to know where we've come from in order to know where we're going so we're going to have a little look at the history of machine learning um, and whilst the history of machine learning isn't totally standardized there's a few competing views i think we've come to the general consensus in terms of um, the origins of machine learning we're going to look at how machine learning um, fits in in terms of artificial intelligence. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are two really, uh, really big buzzwords at the moment in terms of business um, and data science. And it's really handy and helps us have credible conversations if we can understand how the hierarchy works and how machine learning fits into AI or the other way around. So we'll have a little look at that. Um, there are three main flavors of machine learning, unsupervised, supervised, and reinforcement learning. And as um, machine learning is quite a new thing, um, relatively speaking, in terms of its use within business, um, it wouldn't be surprising if more uh, flavors of machine learning are added in, uh, over time. So we're going to look at the three main types, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. We're going to look at some common machine learning algorithms. We're potentially, well, we're not potentially, we're definitely going to do a little bit of linear regression as well. So linear regression turns out to be one of the foundational um, machine learning algorithms within data science. I mean, it's quite a nice one to take a look at. So we're going to have a little look at that um, in a couple of slides time. And we're going to have a look at some common machine learning tools as well. So we're going to learn about the history. We're going to learn about the flavors. We're going to learn about the algorithms that underpin machine learning. Uh, but actually, how do you do it? Where, where would we even start in order to start thinking about machine learning? So we've got some slides in terms of a toolbox um, and some suggestions in terms of where you might want to start um, kind of pushing on your continuous professional development in terms of machine learning. Right, so Phoebe's kind of done this a little bit, but I just want to kind of confirm why I am talking to you. They're not just chosen some random random northerner off the street. There is a reason I am speaking for you here, um, speaking here with you today. So I graduated um, from university with a chemistry degree, um, very, very challenging. Didn't really realize how difficult it would be right at the beginning of my degree. Everyone I lived with did six hours a week. I did 26 hours a week. Um, so there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge. So after university, I moved to a company called CHEP uh, and CHEP do pallets and pallets, no, there's no way to make pallets rock and roll. So um, CHEP pallets basically allow the country to eat and to buy stuff. Everything you eat or you've eaten today will have at some stage um, arrived into the UK or transported around the UK on a CHEP pallet. Um, I was young and naive um, and I didn't like telling, telling people I worked for CHEP because no one knew who it was. So in that young and naive stage, I looked for another job and I saw criminal intelligence analysts for Greater Manchester Police. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's moving from moving wood around the country to actually um, trying to make things better in terms of um, criminality and well-being and safeguarding, et cetera, et cetera. So I was an intelligence analyst at Great Manchester Police for a couple of years, moved up to a higher analyst, then to a senior analyst, finished at GMP in the Force Intelligence Bureau, creating the um, strategic assessment and being exposed to the full gamut of intelligence that um, large metropolitan police forces gather. Um, I decided I want a bit of a, a change of scenery and I moved to British Transport Police on, um, for, so kind of from a regional or greater Manchester kind of geography over to a national geography. Um, I was a performance and analysis manager and a, a senior analyst after some restructures within British Transport Police. Um, and then I finally, I ended up as an intelligence manager and that was one of the own, that was normally a job reserved for a detective inspector and I wasn't a warranted police officer. Um, but through luck and restructures and me being capable, um, I was the first in a civilian intelligence manager in British Transport Police's history. And I think that's probably about 170 years worth of kind of policing history there. Um, and then I decided I wanted to transition my career again. Um, so I'm, I'm very much up for kind of getting as much wide experience as possible. Um, and I saw an opportunity for Firebrand as a subject matter expert in data and business analysis. Um, and I went for it and I was successful. And that's kind of why I'm talking with you today. Um, so Phoebe's kind of already mentioned this, but I think it's just in case anyone hasn't used Zoom. And I would imagine that everyone is fairly familiar with Zoom and we probably got very sick with Zoom after the millionth family quiz. Um, but if you haven't used Zoom, 
Uh, there's a little menu item uh, along the bottom which has the, the usual things you'll find on a, on a web on a kind of conferencing uh, tool: the mute video, the stop video button, the security settings. Should you wish to have a fill fill with those, there's a participant setting, the chat settings as well. Obviously, you won't be showing any screens. Phoebe is recording it, and any nice reactions, I'm sure, would be most welcome. Absolutely most welcome. Um, so mute yourself if you're not speaking. I think I'll probably be the only person speaking. Um, use the chat box appropriately. Never had anyone use it inappropriately. So it's probably teaching you things you already know. Um, and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So like Phoebe said, if, they, if you have got kind of burning questions, probably better to leave until the end. Um, but don't be shy in coming forward. Right. So what is machine learning? What is this thing that everyone keeps going on about? So machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. It's uh, seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. So that's the first kind of tip in terms of um, the hierarchical or hierarchical relationship between the two kind of disciplines. Uh, machine learning algorithms build mathematical models based on sample data known as training data and that's in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. So machine learning is really algorithms that take training data and in some cases don't take training data um, and they make decisions or predictions without being explicitly programmed to do so. So where has machine learning come from? So machine learning, super important aspect of modern business and research. And I'm sure you all, be, all agree that it's an ever increasing and important aspect of modern business and research. And it uses algorithms and neural network models to assist computer systems progressively improving their performance. Machine learning algorithms automatically build mathematical models using sample data known as training data. And they do that to make decisions without being specifically programmed to make those decisions. But where has machine learning come from? And there are lots of competing views in terms of um, who coined the phrase, who developed what, at what stage. Um, but I think the general consensus is Mr. Donald Webb. Donald Webb. Um, and machine learning is in part based on a model of brain cell interaction. And that model was created by Donald in 1949. And he um, kind of uh, articulated that creation in a book titled The Organization of Behavior. And the book presents uh, Hebb's theories on neuron, ex neuron excitement and communication between neurons. So really looking at how the brain works. And if we fundamentally understand how our human brain works, we can start to use some of that learning in terms of machine learning. Um, so the second individual that helped the birth of machine learning was Arthur Samuel. And there's Arthur's picture there. So Arthur Samuel, um, he worked at IBM a long, long time ago, back in the 1950s, and he developed a computer program for playing checkers. Um, and since the program had a very small amount of computer memory available, um, Samuel initiated what is called alpha beta pruning. And he, his design included a scoring function using the positions of the checker pieces on the board, and the scoring function attempted to measure the chances of each side winning. The program chooses its next move using a minimax strategy, which eventually evolved into the minimax algorithm. So yeah, there's a quite a fundamental, uh, a fundamental thrust with him in machine learning in terms of almost games and, and trying to predict how humans play games. Um, next individual that was critical to kind of the origins of machine learning was this guy here, Frank Rosenblatt. So in 57, 1957, Frank Rosenblatt, he was working at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory. Uh, and he combined Donald Hebb's model of brain uh, cell interaction with Arthur Samuel's machine learning efforts. And he created what was called the perceptron. And it was described as the first successful neurocomputer. The Mark I perceptron developed some problems with broken expectations. Although the perceptron seemed promising, it could not recognize many kinds of visual patterns, such as faces. And that's what it was designed to do. It was designed to take images and classify them. Um, and it caused frustration, and it really did stall the neural network research widely, uh, widely across the globe. And it would be several years before the frustrations of investors and funding agencies faded. Um, in the 1950s, very similar to today, when new technology comes around, people want to get involved in that, want to get that, they call it sweet equity, get right at the beginning to potentially make the most amount of money. Um, so in, in the kind of the, the early 60s, um, kind of late 60s, the funding was unsure. A lot of people were unsure in terms of how to fund this new technology. Um, and machine learning research really struggled with a resurgence during the 1990s. And that resurgence looked like um, the nearest neighbor algorithm. Um, and so that is uh, a clustering algorithm which looks to cluster similar data points spatially. 
Um, and so in 1967, the nearest neighbor algorithm was conceived, which is the beginning of basic pattern recognition. And this algorithm was used for mapping routes and was one of the earliest algorithms used in finding a solution to the traveling salesperson's problem of finding the most efficient route. And it's funny how um, issues that are potentially an issue today were issues in 1950 as well, trying to make the most efficient use of salespeople's time um, is, still a, is still something that's really critical today as it was in 1950. So using it, a salesperson enters a selected city and repeatedly has the program visit the nearest cities until all have been visited. Marco Piello has been given credit for inventing the nearest neighbor rule. Um, uh, and he in turn credits uh, the famous cover and heart paper of 1967, which the, the link is in the notes. Um, so the next stage was a little bit of a divergence in paths. Machine learning and artificial intelligence took different paths in the early 70s uh, or the late 70s and the early 80s. Artificial intelligence research had focused on using logical, uh, logic knowledge-based approaches rather than algorithms. Additionally, neural network research was abandoned by computer science and AI researchers, and this caused a schism between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Until then, machine learning had been used as a training program for artificial intelligence. The machine learning industry, which included large, a large number of researchers and technicians, was recognized into a separate field and struggled for nearly a, dec a decade. The industry goal shifted for, from training for artificial intelligence in terms of solving practical problems around providing services. The focus shifted from approaches inherent from AI research to methods and tactics using probability theory and statistics. Um, and certainly if you start to progress your learning in terms of machine learning, statistics is a funda absolutely fundamental element to it. Uh, and I suppose a good knowledge of math is an absolutely fundamental uh, element to statistics. So during this time, the machine learning industry maintained its focus on neural networks and then it flourished in the 1990s. And most of that success um, was the result of internet growth, benefiting from the ever-growing availability of digital data and the ability to share services by the way of the internet. Then we had Robert Shapir. So Robert Shapir, he was key in developing what are called boosting algorithms. And boosting was a necessary development for the evolution of machine learning. So boosting algorithms are used to reduce bias during supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, and they include machine learning algorithms that transform weak learners into strong ones. So data points or variables that don't give you a particularly strong indication of, of uh, predictive nature, they can be joined together to create strong learners. And Shapire states that a set of weak learners can create a single strong learner. Weak learners are defined as classifiers that are only slightly correlated with the true classification, um, but it's still better than random guess guessing. By contrast, a strong learner is easily classified and well aligned with the true classification. So it's really taking lots and lots and lots of variables, and in some cases, amalgamating those variables together and taking them from a weak variable with weak ability to predict into a strong ability to, to predict. So most boosting algorithms are made up of repetitive learning weak classifiers, which then add a final strong classifier. After being added, they are normally weighted in a way that evaluates the weak learner's accuracy and the data weights are reweighted. Input data is misclassified, then gains a higher weight, while the data classified correctly loses weight. And then in this environment, it allows future weak learners to focus more extensively on previous weak learners that were misclassified. Then it really starts to get interesting. So we start to get into speech recognition and you'll have to, um, you'll have to kind of forgive my German pronunciation here, but the two individuals on the image here are Jürgen uh, Schmiehuber and Sepp Hochreiter. Hopefully I've got that right, but I don't think they're here today to correct me. And so much of the speech recognition training is being done by a deep learning technique called long short term memory, a neural network model described by Jürgen and Sepp in 1997. And, and this uh, long short-term memory can learn tasks that require the memory of events that took place uh, in thousands of discrete steps earlier, which is quite important for speech. Um, around 2007, long short-term memory started outperforming more traditional speech pattern recognition programs. In 2015, the Google speech recognition program reportedly had a significant performance jump of 49% um, using the long short-term memory uh, method. 
More recently, in 2006, facial recognition became popular and became a reality. Um, and there was a facial recognition grand challenge which evaluated the popular facial recognition algorithms of the time. 3D face scans, iris images, high resolution face images, well, they were all tested. Their findings suggested the new algorithms were 10 times more accurate than facial algorithms of 2002 and 100 times more accurate than those from 1995. Some of the algorithms were even able to outperform human participants in recognizing faces and could uniquely identify um, identical twins. In 2012, Google's X Lab developed a machine learning, a machine learning algorithm that can autonomously browse and find videos fi um, containing cats. Um, how useful that is for humanity, uh, I'll let you decide, but it's probably along the path of learning how to exploit uh, machine learning. In 2014, Facebook developed DeepFace, an algorithm of capable of recognizing or verifying individuals in photos with the same accuracy as humans. So tagging, photo, tagging people in photos in Facebook became automated through machine learning. And so more recently in terms of machine learning, it's been defined by Stanford University as the science of getting to computers to act without being explicitly programmed. And we saw that in the, in the initial slides in terms of the definition. Machine learning is now responsible for some of the most significant advancements in technology, such as the new industry of self-driving vehicles. Machine learning has prompted a new array of concepts and technologies included supervised and unsupervised learning, new algorithms for robots, the internet of things, analytical chat box, uh, analytical tools, chat box, and even more but there is a danger with machine learning there is a danger with machine learning um, and this this image could could sink like a lead balloon potentially um, but 10 years ago um, this image went viral and for those of you that don't know this image is of Diego Maradona and Diego Maradona is perhaps one of the most famous footballers um, and if you were an England fan back in 98 1986 you'll remember Diego um, removing England from a World Cup competition with his hand um, which wasn't great. It was deemed the hand of God. But Diego was famous for a few other things as well, a few other things. And one of the things he was famous for um, was he had a little bit of a cocaine habit, a little bit of a cocaine habit. Um, and this picture came out about, I think it was about 10 years ago. Um, and as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is the perfect example of human bias. So there, a, a video came out of Diego clearly on a private jet with a, a, a menagerie of what, some foods I've probably never eaten and never seen. Um, and he was super impressed with himself about being able to drink a shot of, I assume, tequila or something from his elbow. But that, that wasn't the reason the video went viral on the internet. The reason the video went viral was for this little thing below his hat. This little thing below his hat. And so for the uninitiated and knowing all you know about Maradona or don't know about Maradona, you might jump to the assumption that that is a massive bag of cocaine. Um, and so this video went viral because everyone was saying, well, Maradona's uh, he's obviously fallen off the wagon and he's back taking cocaine. Um, and that was a perfect example of human bias because it transpires that this little bit here is not cocaine at all. It's a water bottle with a paper receipt. <laughs> and that's partly why the video went viral because everybody assumed Maradona was back on cocaine, whereas reality, um, well, I suppose we can't say definitively it wasn't, but it, there was no bag of cocaine on this table. It was a water bottle and a receipt. And I just think it's a really good example of how human bias can play a, a really important part in machine learning. Um, and the thing with machine learning is that a lot of the algorithms have been developed by white men, um, middle-aged white men. Um, a lot of the tools that we developed are created by that same demographic and individual. A lot of the data is collected by humans in the same way. So actually, potentially, our machine learning algorithms are inherently biased. Um, and we need to be aware of that because actually we need to fight that bias. And one of the ways of fighting that bias is having really diverse teams in terms of um, data science teams, making sure we've got a real diversity in terms of um, across the human population to make sure that, say, for instance, we're unaware of some bias that we carry. Other people on our team that don't have that paradigm or haven't had that environment may well not have that same bias uh, and can, can point it out to us as well. So although data and computer computational analysis may make us think that we are receiving objective information, this is not necessarily the case. Being based on data does not mean machine learning outputs are neutral. Human bias plays a role in how the data is collected, how it is organized, and ultimately how the algorithms that determine the machine learning will interact with the data. And so because human bias can negatively impact others, it's extremely important to be aware of it and also to work towards eliminating as much as possible. And like I said, one of the ways to eliminate um, bias within machine learning is to have as diverse a team of people that are testing and reviewing um, and assessing the, the implications of that machine learning algorithm. 
So where does machine learning fit in with artificial intelligence? Um, and, and one of the things that I've kind of realized throughout my career, um, and realistically machine learning has kind of really only entered my career in kind of the last five years. And we were doing very basic machine learning in, in the police forces in terms of trying to predict who would offend, reoffend, and who wouldn't reoffend. And if we knew who would reoffend, we could potentially put some mitigations and interventions to potentially stop them or divert them onto a different activity, which is more positive for society. Um, and one of the critical things that I found, and certainly in those early five years, was credibility. Um, not a lot of people knew what they were talking about in terms of machine learning. Um, and they mixed artificial intelligence and machine learning together at will, um, and their credibility sank as a result. And I think potentially machine learning hasn't really taken off because people really don't have this firm understanding of how it works. So machine learning is very much um, a hier in a hierarchical relationship with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is something that humans are striving, striving to obtain. And it's the study of agents that perceive the world around them. Um, artificial intelligence is able to form plans and make decisions to achieve, a, achieve goals. Its foundations are around mathematics, logic, philosophy, probability, linguistics, neuroscience, decision theory. Many of these fields fall under the umbrella of AI, such as computer vision, robotics, machine learning, and natural language processing. So actually, artificial intelligence is kind of the wider banner um, for, for doing that, for making plans, for making decisions, for achieving goals. And machine learning um, is a subset of artificial intelligence. And realistically, I think as we move forward um, uh, globally, many, many elements of machine learning will ultimately come together to join to create some kind of artificial intelligence. So machine learning and artificial intelligence is very much a hierarchical relationship. So machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And its goal, like we've learned earlier today, its goal is to enable computers to learn on their own. Machine learning algorithms enable to, um, machines to identify patterns and observe data, build models that explain the world, predict things without having explicit pre programmed rules or models. And so there are different flavors of machine learning, and we're going to get onto those um, flavors in a second, but they're broadly supervised learning, where we have um, labeled data that we can give to a, a machine learning algorithm, and it can train itself, and then we can give it some other data. Uh, and once it's trained itself, it can have a fairly good stab at, at classifying or predicting um, what the new data is saying. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, there is no training data. So there's no training data whatsoever with unsupervised learning. So the algorithm has no human input no human input whatsoever. Uh, and reinforcement learning, I suppose all of this is new, but reinforcement learning is probably one of the new facets of machine learning. And so that really is looking at reward maximization. Uh, and we're gonna go a bit deeper into the, the three flavors of machine learning as we go on, but a little bit conscious of time and we're rocking up to a break. So we'll, we'll probably just qualify. Um, why are we even looking at machine learning? Why is this thing even important? Um, and it, it's not as simple as IBM say so, but to a certain extent, IBM have defined back in 2017, they did a really big bit of strategic analysis around data science. Um, and they looked at the skills in the data science market um, and they created what's called a magic quadrant. And if you haven't ever seen one of these magic quadrants before, they actually are very, very cool things. So they're a really cool visualization for helping you understand um, what kind of projected growth there might be in some of the technologies and skills um, and how hard those those jobs may well be to fill um, and you know simple capitalism says supply and demand and so if there is a huge demand and not a great deal of supply then there might be a, a lot of money to be made within data science which um, may well suit some people definitely so IBM in 2017 took a really strategic view in terms of where kind of data science is moving um, and their view was that data science and data visualization and the use of R and machine learning and big data and Apache Hadoop and data engineering and data taxonomy, they were the key skills that data scientists are going to need in the future. Um, and a lot of companies, a lot of training providers, a lot of large organizations have recognized this and are starting to develop plans in order to give their members of staff these types of skills. And, and to a certain extent, this Firebrand Sprint today is the very beginning potentially of getting some skills on one of the most sought after um, sought after skills in the modern workplace, which is machine learning. So one final slide before we get into the real flavors of machine learning. Um, I think it's just handy to start to look at some of the specific algorithms um, that build up machine learning. So we've kind of, we already have understand or we're on the, the path to understanding there are three main flavors of machine learning. 
um, unsupervised learning. So that's learning where there is no human input, there's no labeled training data. Uh, and so maybe take, for instance, um, a scenario. So you work in, uh, you work in a safari park um, in Africa. Um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to count how many of a certain type of lion there are in the safari park in order to know um, how much kind of conservation work you may want to do. Um, but there are thousands and thousands of lions in the safari park and the safari park is massive. So conceivably, um, for a human to go and identify every single lion is going to be incredibly um, tricky thing to do, incredibly um, long thing to do. And so a lot of people, they'll set up little cameras. They're called, uh, I don't know, motion cameras. And so every time an animal goes past a camera, it takes a picture of the, of the animal. Um, but actually, after a couple of days worth of doing that, you might have 50,000 pictures of animals. Um, and so would, you could choose a human to go through every single one of those 50,000 pictures um, and see whether they can recognize lions. Um, or you could choose a different mechanism. You could um, give a machine learning algorithm, I don't know, say a collection of 1,000 pictures um, where you've, you've labeled it as a lion. Here is a picture and here is what it is, it's a lion. That machine learning algorithm will use that training data set with that labeled data um, uh, and then figure out how to recognize a lion. When it's given new images, because it's been given um, a training data set, it's pretty accurate at identifying across those, say, 49,000 other images, which one is a lion and which one isn't. Um, those accuracy levels, probably between 80 and 95%, so actually fairly high accuracy levels. Um, but that's supervised learning. So that's actually giving, um, giving the machine learning algorithm um, labeled training data. And labeled training data in that kind of safari example would be a picture of a lion with uh, a field that says this is a lion. You can, we've identified this as a lion for you. Um, so then we have unsupervised learning. So that's effectively try to identify a lion, but we're not going to give you any pictures of lions and tell you that they are lions. And actually, um, you're unable to do any kind of classification with unsupervised learning. That is an impossible thing to do at the moment. So algorithms cannot identify lions if they're not already given pictures of identified lions. So the other flavor of machine learning is unsupervised learning. Um, and this is probably where I started my career out in terms of machine learning. So I was very much within the police looking at clustering. So I wasn't doing recommender systems or targeted marketing. I was kind of doing targeted marketing, but not the kind of marketing that anybody wants to receive. And I was kind of doing customer segmentation, but again, not for the type of marketing that anyone necessarily wants to receive. So I didn't even know I was doing machine learning back in those days. I definitely did not know I was doing unsupervised machine learning, but I was using crime points, crime points, and I was using K nearest neighbors to cluster those crime points into hotspots. And then I would send police officers to said hotspots to try and see whether they could become less hot. Um, and then we've got reinforcement learning. So uh, reinforcement learning is, the, is, I suppose, of this whole area, which is a new area in humanity. Reinforcement learning is the new area of the new area. Um, so game AI starts to come into here. And if any of you are gamers, I'm a big gamer. Um, sometimes I don't play against other humans and I play against the computer. Um, but I want to feel like I'm playing against a human. So game AI, AI um, is fundamentally important within the video games industry. Um, skills acquisition. So how we go about gaining skills is fundamentally important as well. Clearly real-time decision-making and robot navigation is going to become, going to become even more important. And if you've ever seen any of those Boston Dynamics robot videos, um, the stuff those robots can do is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, and there is a very famous video of a robot that Boston Dynamics have built. <laughs> the, the guys that have built it just go through a period of tasks, which are basically try and ruin that robot's day, push it over, hit it with a hit it with a baseball bat, throw water over it, throw tar over it, and the robot is so smart you can't push it over. It recognizes it's being pushed and it adjusts itself so it won't fall over. Um, an amazing, an amazing bit of technology, and Boston Dynamics really are doing it for humanity. Um, conscious of time. Super conscious of time. I think if Phoebe is okay, we'll take our first 10 minute break. You let me know if I'm on time for our break, Phoebe. Am I on time for our break, Phoebe? Yes. I am perfect on time timing. Break. So we will resume 10.43? Yes, perfect. Cool, 10.43. So okay. uh, I'll see pop everybody it in at the 10 chat. No Thank you. See you in 10 minutes, everybody.
Time really does go slowly when you're looking at the clock. Oh, 10.43. There we go. I must have some innate ability at um, estimating time there. <clears throat> I wonder if that's actually of any use. Right, okay, so let's, um, hopefully everybody is super, uh, sufficiently lubricated, you've got yourselves a brew, you're all nice and comfortable to increase the geek for want of a better term. We're gonna increase the geek. Okay, so we finished on, what did we finish on, Sean? We finished on the different types of machine learning and some of the algorithms in here um, that can help us. So let's maybe pick out some of these and see whether they can actually make any sense to us or whether they can actually help us. So weather forecasting, Oh, that's a super important one. Supervised learning, machine learning algorithms in terms of regression. Um, and we're gonna have a little look at regression in a little bit more depth. Um, can forecast our weather, clearly an important thing. The amount of um, kind of wildfires going on across the globe is obviously not a good thing, probably inherently related to climate change, although there are lots of different um, opinions on that. Estimated life expectancy, super important thing for lots of well-developed, for lots of developed and undeveloped countries in the world. Life expectancies are are, are increasing, and that is causing um, lots of issues in terms of pensions, in terms of healthcare, in terms of provision for those uh, for those older people. Population growth, I think, for me personally, hugely important one in the UK. I've just got a sneaking old suspicion, and um, we've got a lot more people in the UK than we would perhaps. Um, had estimated, had anticipated, and I don't think our public services have natu na um, naturally kept up. Um, but I suppose the counter to that is more people in the UK, more people paying into tax, more tax to be spent on public services. I suppose that is kind of the idea around it. Identity fraud is a super important one, super, super important one um, these days. Firebrand work with a lot of large financial services clients, and they are fully clued in and fully using um, this kind of latest technology in terms of identity fraud uh, detection. So for instance, um, most people are using online banking apps nowadays, aren't they? Um, and your bank will be keeping a record of every time you've accessed that app for how long you've accessed it for, where you've accessed it from, what elements of that banking app you go into. Um, so they can build up a pattern of regular behavior. And when they see a pattern of irregular behavior, then they can start to intervene and make interventions. We've already talked about image classification in terms of my lion example, perhaps not the best example, a little bit difficult to get your head around, um, but it does actually happen. Safari parks are actually deploying cameras and using machine learning algorithms to count how many, I don't know, aardvarks they have or whatever they are looking to count. So let's have a little bit more um, of a look at the supervised and unsupervised learning piece. So, Supervised learning. The main thing to recognize here is this little element here. This little element here with a supervisor, a human, a training data set, which a human has verified and has given to the algorithm. So the algorithm is being supervised in some way. And that supervision looks like giving the algorithm um, correctly identified stuff. So here's a picture of a lion. It's definitely a lion. Use this picture to help you predict other pictures where you don't know whether it's a lion as to whether it's a lion or not. So we have supervised learning. So we start with data, a data set containing training examples with associated correct labels. For example, when learning to classify handwritten digits, a supervised learning algorithm takes thousands, thousands and thousands, as many pictures as it can of handwritten digits, along with a human that's gone, that's a one, that's a seven, that's an eight, that's a nine, that's an 11. And the algorithm will then learn the relationship between the images and their associated numbers that the human has defined and apply that learned relationship to classify completely new images that don't have any labels, that the machine hasn't ever seen before. So we could, you could think of it in terms of regression as well. So um, you could predict a continuous numerical variable um, and work out how much a house will sell for. Um, so housing, um, housing price increased is fairly linear. Or clearly there are, there are big shifts in that linear relationship when big kind of um, global events happen. 9-11, um, for instance, or the financial crash of 2008 had a huge impact in terms of house prices. Uh, we could also use it, um, like I said, to classify pictures. Is it a lion? Is it not a lion? Is it a cat or a dog? So unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms infer patterns from a data set without reference to known or labeled outcomes. So unlike supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning methods cannot be directly applied to regression or classification problems because they've got no idea what the values that they are looking for. So you can't, um, you can't get a machine learning algorithm to identify pictures of lions if you haven't given it pictures of identified lions. It just will not work. It can't do it.
but unsupervised learning can be useful. Um, in ways that it can be particularly useful is it can help you um, find out the underlying structure of a data set and inherently understanding the structure of your data set allows you to generate more and better and effective insight from it. How do you summarize and group it most in, um, usefully? So one of the main um, unsupervised uh, algorithms is clustering. And I was doing clustering when I was doing crime mapping, but clustering could be um, segmenting customers into a couple of segments. So I don't know, we want to market to high value customers, medium value customers and low value customers. Um, but actually we need to know which customers fall in which pot. Well, how are we going to work out? We've got a million customers here. We can't have a human go through all these customers and go that pot, that pot, that pot. We need a better way of doing it. And that's where unsupervised learning comes in and clustering will segment those customers into those pots for you. So clustering is spatially driven rather than probability driven. So it's the relationship um, spatially. How close is this data point to this other data point? And looking at all these data points, can we group them into a, into a cluster? Um, so you might be thinking, well, well, when have you ever, other than crime mapping, Sean, when have you ever done that? And when have I ever experienced that? So you may, if you've ever stayed in a BM, Airbnb house, and I have, and it wasn't great, but we may well have done. So Airbnb groups its housing listings into neighborhoods so that it can and users can navigate that list more easily. So it's kind of similar to me grouping crime points together and deploying police officers to places. Um, clustering of crime points is my, is my next bullet point. Um, uh, and we, we could even have uh, Experian mosaic clusters that cluster people into groups. Um, <laughs> Experian are a massive, uh, a massive organization that provide lots and lots of open source data. Um, and they provided a data set called Mosaics, uh, Mosaic. And it was a data set that clustered the UK population into segments. Um, and those, some of those segments weren't great. And the way that they articulate those segments weren't great. So they defined people in terms of these are people that um, have low paid jobs, watch Coronation Street and eat pot noodle. And whilst that may well be super important um, for some companies, maybe the people that make pot noodle and the produce Coronation Street, actually it didn't really fit, um, didn't really fit ethically with me, kind of defining people like that. And I'm sure if you showed those people that you were clustered into the Coronation Street watching pot noodle eating cluster, if you told them that, they probably wouldn't be very happy about it. So there is another flavor of, um, of supervised learning. It's called semi-supervised learning. And I apologies for bringing up the kind of um, the CT scan of, somebody, of somebody's lungs, um, but it, there's, a, there's method to that madness. So semi-supervised learning is, for the most part, exactly what it sounds like. It, a training data set with both labeled and unlabeled data. Um, and this method is particularly useful when extracting relevant features from the, when, from the data is difficult and a bit subjective and trying to identify a tumor from a, an X-ray probably a little bit subjective to a certain extent. Um, it may also be used for when labeling examples is a really time intensive task for experts. So um, it, labeling those pictures to make sure that when we have identified lines or not. So in some cases that can be really, really intensive. If you've got 50 million pictures um, to get a decent training data set, you're probably gonna have to label a lot of those images and that can take quite a long time. So semi-supervised learning is especially useful for medical images where a small amount of labeled data can lead to a significant improvement in accuracy. So common situations for this, um, kind of learning and medical images like CT scans or MRIs. So a trained radiologist can go through and label a small subset of scans for tumors or diseases, um, but it would be too time intensive and costly to manually label all the scans. Uh, but deep learning, a deep learning network can still benefit from a small proportion of labeled data and improve its accuracy compared to a fully unsupervised model. A popular training method starts with a fairly more small set of labeled data. Um, and one of those methods is called a GAN, and that stands for General Adversarial Network. And it's actually quite a cool little thing that GANs do. So imagine um, two algorithms in competition, and each are trying to outsmart the other. Oh, competition algorithms, could it get any more rock and roll? And that's a General Adversarial, adversarial Network. One of the networks is called the generator, and that tries to create new data points that mimic the training data. So it tries to create fake data effectively, mimicking the training data. The other network, which is called the discriminator, that pulls in those, that newly generated data and tries to work out whether it's part of the training data or it's been generated in a fake. Um, and the networks improve in a positive feedback loop. As the discriminator gets better at separating the fakes from the original, the generator improves its ability to create convincing fakes. Um, so it's almost like machi two machine learning algorithms stuck together in an adversarial network and they're trying to outdo each other. And if you let them outdo each other for long enough, um, they're going to become very, very accurate at what they're doing. 
um, reinforcement learning. So this is this is the more modern aspect of machine learning. Clearly, machine learning is super modern, but if there's a more modern bit of the modern thing, it's this reinforcement learning piece. Um, and reinforcement learning, I suppose the easiest way to think about it is, um, I suppose the general direction with data science and machine learning is to try and to emulate the human brain and the way that we learn. And so reinforcement learning is really a really good example of, of machine learning trying to mirror how a human learns. Um, so reinforcement learning video games are full of reinforcement cues complete a level earn a badge defeat a bad guy or bad girl in a certain number of moves earn a bonus step into a trap game over uh, and so those cues help human players learn how to improve their performance for the next game and without that feedback they would just take random actions around a game environment in the random hope of advancing to the next level and clearly we don't do that we learn from our mistakes and reinforcement learning uh, operates on the same principle and actually video games are a common test environment for this kind of research to generate an ai um, player that you can realistically play against so in this uh, kind of machine learning AI agents are attempting to find the optimal way to accomplish a particular goal or improve performance on a specific uh, uh, a specific task as the agent takes action that goes toward the goal it receives a war a reward the overall aim is to predict the next step to earn the biggest reward really really simple to make its choices the agent relies on both learnings from past feedback an exploration of new tactics that may present a larger payoff. Uh, and this involves a long-term strategy. Just as the best immediate move in chess in a chess game may not help you win in the long run, the agent tries to maximize the cumulative reward, not the really small reward. It's an iterative process. The more rounds of feedback, the better the agent becomes and the better its strategy becomes. And this technique is especially useful for training robots. Um, I bumped into a wall. Well, okay, I, won't, <laughs> I know where the wall is now. I won't bump into that again. Oh, I bumped into a human's leg. Well, I know where that leg is. I won't bump into that again. Um, and so uh, it allows it to make a series of decisions in tasks like steering an autonomous vehicle or managing an inventory in a warehouse. Um, Pit AI is at the forefront of leveraging reinforcement learning for evaluating trading strategies. It's turning out to be a robust tool for training systems to optimize financial objectives. And when we talk about trading, we're talking uh, billions effectively, trying to um, buy low and sell high in terms of stock. And it has immense applications in stock market trading where Q-learning algorithms are able to learn optimal trading strategies with one simple instruction. <laughs> not make the globe better place, maximize the value of our portfolio. Um, this way, anyone who is able to get their hands on Q-learning algorithms will potentially be able to gain income without worrying about the market price or risks involved, since the Q-learning algorithm is smart to take all these considerations, uh, all these uh, variables into consideration when making the trade. Um, what it probably can't predict is a global pandemic or, I don't know, a major terrorist attack and stuff like that. And there are always limitations, always limitations. So the main or algorithm um, within uh, reinforcement learning is called Q-learning. And so consider the scenario of teaching a dog new tricks. tricks. Um, the dog doesn't understand our language. No matter how much we shout at a dog, it just doesn't understand it. I remember walking past someone and saying, can you get your dog to stop barking? And I turned to Crumpet, my dog, and I said, Crumpet, stop barking. And he continued barking. I went, he doesn't understand me, mate. <laughs> oh, I had so much fun with that. But the dog clearly doesn't understand our language, so we can't tell him what to do, him or her what to do. Instead, we follow a, d a different strategy. We emulate a situation or a cue, and the dog tries to respond in many different ways. If the dog's response is the desired one, we re reward them with a snack or a stroke or something like that. Now, guess what? The next time the dog is exposed to a same situation, the dog executes a similar action with even more enthusiasm in the expectation of even more food. Um, and you can very quickly have a very fat dog if it, if it knows what it's doing. Um, and that's like learning what to do from positive experiences, i.e. reinforcement learning. Similarly, dogs will tend to learn not what to do with faced with negative expect expectations or experiences. And that's exactly how reinforcement le learning works in the broadest sense. Your dog is an agent that is exposed to the environment. The environment could be your house, could be with you. The situations they are counter are analogous to a state. An example of a state could be your dog standing and you use a specific word in a certain tone in your living room to make the dog sit. 
or not sit, however, you, however well trained your dog is. Our agents react by performing an action to transition from one state to another state, from standing to sitting. Your dog goes from standing to sitting, for example. After the transition, they might receive a reward or a penalty in return. You give them a treat or a no as a penalty. The policy is the strategy of choosing an action, giving the state an expectation of better outcomes. And so it's, you know, it's really funny how we look at the natural world and things that occur naturally in our environment um, and try to emulate them with computers. And it's just an interesting way that humans go about things. Right, let's increase the geek. So one of the most fundamental um, and simplest to understand algorithms within machine learning is linear modeling. And so I'm just going to teach you, well, teach you, kind of expose you very quickly to linear modeling. Um, and it can become an incredibly dry subject without a great deal of rock and roll. And in what is probably just a lame attempt at making it slightly more interesting, I've used an open source data set, the FIFA 18 player football game player data set. Um, the reason I use it is because uh, FIFA is an incredibly successful game and had it not got a really robust um, engine in behind it. So say for instance, you play a football game, you play against Real Madrid, you don't expect the Real Madrid goalkeeper to dribble past every single one of your players and smash it into the top corner. Uh, you'd wouldn't get, you wouldn't like that as a game. It's not very realistic. So EA have spent a lot of money developing a data set which um, helps a model or an engine um, realistically uh, play football. So I used a FIFA 18 data set. It might not be um, hugely, it might be a little bit gender specific, but I apologize for that. But I think everybody can, well, as you might not love football, you can probably relate to it. So the FIFA data set has loads and loads of variables and those variables describe how good those football players are. So Lionel Messi is one of the fastest players, has one of the best shot accuracies. And so there are loads and loads of data um, which inform how good players are. So then that information can be used to generate an engine and a model and you can feel that you're realistically playing a, a game of football against Real Madrid and you haven't got their goalkeeper dribbling past every player and scoring. Um, and so we can use that FIFA player data set to evidence some linear regression. And what we're going to do is very quickly, we're just going to see whether there's a relationship and we can kind of see whether there is or there isn't already. We're going to see there's a relationship between a footballer in the FIFA 18 data set, um, their ability to cross a football, is it related to their ability to pass a football over a short distance? Um, and one of the main ways that we would display and visualize that relationship would be through a scatterball. And this is what we have got here. So all of these blue points, these are 18,000 data points on this scatter plot. Um, and each data point is a footballer and each data point represents a value for crossing and a value for short passing. So for this person here, they have a, a roughly an eight for crossing, but they have about a 65 for short passing. And you can see that the look, there appears to be a linear, there appears to be some kind of relationship between the ability to short pass a football and cross a football. Um, it, it's kind of linear. So as people get better at short passing, they tend to get better at crossing or the other way around. And you could apply some mathematical kind of principles and values to that. And the first one you would apply would be an R squared value. So an R squared value is a mathematical value it has, uh, it can only be between zero and one, and it, it's an indication of how well these data points fit this trend line. So this trend line um, has iteratively been placed over this data set. So what this program is Excel, what Excel does is it will draw a thousand of these trend lines across these data, and maybe even more, um, and it will work out which one has the best R squared value, and that's the one it will show you. So the R squared value, kind of the first foray into interpreting a statistical value from a machine learning algorithm. Um, and that's the kind of place we want to be because we want to know how good our machine learning algorithms are. It isn't just good enough saying, oh, we'll choose one. Well, you need to know how good it is. And if it isn't that good, you need to know how to make it better as well. And this is the, these are the first steps in doing that. So the data fits the trend line pretty well, but the R squared value turns out not to be a measure of correlation. So it isn't a specific measure of correlation. It's just a measure of goodness of fit. Um, with an Excel and certainly the later versions of Excel and this is how potentially simple you might think all oh, machine learning is only an R in Python well yeah majority of it is but you can certainly have a good foundational start within Excel and the data analysis tool pack and so in the later versions of Excel 2016 onwards and if you're into data the data analysis tool pack is a fundamental little add-on that Excel has it comes with every installation of, of Excel if you want to become um, more data savvy you want to become more statistical in your work really good place to start uh, and actually to carry out a correlation test is frighteningly simple i need to think of three things where's my data do i have labels in the first row as in is does a1 say short passing and b1 say crossing um, and where do you want the result to go 
So I've run that correlation coefficient across all 18,000 records, and I've just cut those 18,000 records into the two columns to make it simpler. And it gives me another number. Oh, maths loves numbers. Does it not love numbers? Um, but there's a, there are some kind of rules around this number. The number can't be above one. It can't be below minus one. Anywhere near to either one or negative one indicates a strong relationship. So 0 0.89 is pretty close to one. So there's a strong positive relationship between the variables crossing and short passing. Um, and I think it's probably time now to make you aware of correlation and causation. So just because there's a really strong mathematical correlation between crossing and short passing in terms of a footballer's ability, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a relationship in life. Actually, because crossing and short passing are fundamental skills of footballers, there's clearly a relationship between these two. But for instance, there is a 0 0.9 um, strength correlation between the release of Nicolas Cage films and suicides by hanging. Now, there probably isn't a strong relationship in life around those two things. And you know what? If you were Nicolas Cage, you'd be definitely saying there's no relationship between the two things. So there are lots of things that can be correlated really closely mathematically. It does not mean they're correlated in real life. So there's a correlation between margarine consumption and divorce rate. So as you consume more margarine, the likelihood of you getting divorced increases. But there probably isn't a relationship between those two things. So things can be related in maths but not necessarily related in, um, in real life. So that's simple linear regression. Multiple linear regression is a bit more complex. Multiple linear regression, and this is where maths doesn't help itself. Maths likes to explain things in as many different ways as possible, which is a bit bizarre for me. I came from a chemistry background. In chemistry, we had nomenclature, and it was a standard way of describing everything, and everyone described things in exactly the same way. And when you start learning kind of moderate to complex maths, turns out mathematicians didn't have that same thrust. So they like calling things a million different names. Um, so what we're going to have a very quick look at now is multiple linear regression. So um, effectively, we were looking whether there was a relationship between x1 and x2. And now we're going to choose a collection of variables and see whether there's a relationship to a dependent variable, something that's of real interest to us within that data set. And we're going to do that in Excel as well, using the, the regression function in the data analysis toolpack. Super, super simple. This time, two ranges of data. There's a little bit more around confidence levels and outputs and stuff like that. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't stop you from running, um, running the function. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to see whether any of these variables, such as finishing, sprint speed, agility, and reactions, which one of those four most closely correlates the amount of money we pay a footballer. Because the amount of money we pay a footballer, considering it's 565,000 euros a week, uh, is a fairly big ticket item. <laughs> That's an eye-watering uh, amount of money. So actually, maybe we want to see wh what variables relate to that amount of money. So we're going to define sprint speed, finishing, agility, and reactions as independent variables. And we're going to define clean wage as our dependent variable, a big ticket item that we want to, um, that we want to know which of these smaller ticket items has the closest relationship to this big ticket item of clean wage. Because if we can understand this, maybe we can reduce our clean wage and that will be no bad thing. Um, and when I say clean wage, I had to do some cleansing of this data when it came out from um, the FIFA data set. So it wasn't in, a, wasn't in a format which was easily readable, which is why it's called clean wage. I have cleaned the wage variable effectively. And when we run this regression function, um, we get this output. Or we get actually a much more advanced output, but this is the most important bit of this output. Now, when I designed this little example, what I didn't realize was a common term in maths is the term intercept, where, I don't know, your linear regression line intercepts on a y-axis. Quite a fundamental term in a lot of maths clearly a fundamental term in football as well, which I didn't really catch on until, until somebody said, you've got an extra, um, extra variable in here, Sean, called intercept. How come you haven't told us about that? I haven't. This is um, intercept. Is, you'll see this term intercept for any linear regression model that you would do. Um, and so actually, it's important to unpick um, what some of these numbers are telling you. And you might be entirely frightened by seeing these numbers. And to be honest, I was when I first started. But if, when you start to unpick and focus in on some of the important ones, it becomes much easier to understand. So the most important values to understand of this regression output are the coefficient values. Um, and actually, it's, whilst it might appear super complicated, it's actually a pretty simple thing to understand. So what this is saying is, for every 1% increase in clean wage, Finishing increases by 0.07%. For every 1% increase in clean wage, sprint speed goes up by 0.04%. For every 1% increase in clean wage, agility goes down by 0.06%. I'm not entirely convinced by that. 
But where every 1% increase in clean wage, reactions goes up by 1.17%. So out of those four variables, the one that most closely relates to a big ticket variable, one we're super interested in, how much we pay footballers, because that's probably 99% of a football club's outgoings, is literally those 22 players they're paying. Reactions out of those four variables has the biggest biggest relationship to clean wage the other values to be uh, conscious of not just through regression but through a lot of statistical testing and machine learning are p-values and p-values are probability values and the essence of what they're telling you is how likely that these results here have been generated by chance and the closer a p-value is to zero the less likely these values have been generated by chance so we just have a quick cursory look at these values we could ignore the intercept one because that's part of the model and not part of the data 7.9 times 10 to the minus 15 that's pretty close to zero 0.02 pretty close to zero although not as close as that one 5.86 times 10 to the minus 10 pretty close to zero and then our key one reactions well that's actually zero so the chances of any of these results having been obtained by chance are really very very slim which means we can rely on these coefficient values we can make judgments on them um, and we've used 18,000 records so actually it's not really a huge surprise to see these p-values um, as a positive for us. So that's regression. That's regression. So that's looking at relationships between variables. So a, a perfect one to think of is the relationship between um, humans in terms of their height and their weight. So if you were to plot uh, 20 humans on a scatter plot like we did for, um, for crossing and short passing, you'd see a linear relationship between humans' height and weight. As a human gets taller, they weigh more. Yeah, it's just simple physics. Simple physics. Um, so classification is a slightly different way of predicting an outcome. And what classification aims to do is generate a binary outcome. So, uh, oh, I don't know, probably most applicable for us is getting a loan from a bank. And a bank will have a classification tool in the background. It will gather a load of information about you, how old you are, how much money you've got in your bank account, what job you have, um, how many dependents you've got, all that type of stuff. And it will work out whether they lend you money or not. But the outcome is we lend you money, we don't lend you money. It's a binary outcome. There's either yes or there's either no. And they'll often have a logistic regression um, model that will be used to make that judgment. Let's gather a lot of information about Sean and we can make a judgment about how likely he is to pay off that loan or not. And if he isn't particularly likely to pay off that loan, then we're just not going to give it to him. So the example I've got here is of well, four data points. And what this regression or what this logistic regression model is aiming to do is establish from um, a data point and uh, a measure of height whether the data point is going to be overwhelmingly a male or overwhelmingly a female. So for someone that has a height of 80 inches, there's a 95% chance they're a male and a 5% chance they're a, woman, uh, a female. If the height is about 68 inches, it's a 70% chance of a male, 30% chance of a female. Height of about 62 inches, the regression line doesn't really know what it's doing. 50-50 chance it's a man or a woman. Um, so you could use this for all kinds, all kinds of applications. Is this customer going to renew with us or not? Um, is this customer going to complain or not? Is this customer going to pay on time or not? You could factor in a load of information um, and start to make um, predictive judgments on those type of issues. And sometimes those predictive judgments will allow you to put interventions in. Now, one of the things with these machine learning algorithms and particularly classification algorithms, and when I say classification, remember trying to identify a line from a load of pictures. Um, we need to have a measure of how good that machine learning algorithm is, is at identifying um, whether it's identified the correct thing or not identified the correct thing. Um, and how that is wrapped up within machine learning is through a couple of different things. A receiver operating curve is the main um, way of doing that. And so this is the curve here, the receiver operating curve. And it has a value of the area under the curve as well. And what it is, it's um, a ratio of true positives over false positives. So a true positive is I've identified this picture as a lion and it's a lion. A false positive is I've identified this picture as a lion and it's not a lion. Um, so you wouldn't want it if you were wanting to identify lions from pictures, you clearly want it to identify as many correctly as positive as possible. You wouldn't want it to identify incorrectly. And that's where this receiver operating curve comes in, because this shows you how good your machine learning algorithm is at predicting the right thing. And the closer your value is to one, 
the more times you're correctly identifying something, then you're incorrectly identifying something. And so with this curve, you want to be as far up to the top left as possible. And so this is a really common visual um, that machine learning engineers use to show and visualize um, how effective uh, their machine learning algorithm is. And it links into, <laughs> links into a term called a confusion matrix. And I don't think they deliberately named it uh, because it's a super confusing thing, um, but it is actually a little bit of a confusing thing. But don't worry, I have found the means of pregnancy to try and unpick it. Um, so you can kind of think of this confusion matrix thing and identifying the correct thing correctly in terms of pregnancy. So bear with me a second, it's a bit of a weird analogy. Um, but imagine that there is a doctor that says to a pregnant lady, you're pregnant. Well, clearly they've identified the correct thing. But what if you get a doctor that says to a man, you're pregnant? Well, clearly they can't be pregnant. So you've, you've said they're pregnant and they're not. So that's a false positive. Um, maybe you're a doctor, you say to a clearly pregnant woman, you're not pregnant. Pregnant. So you falsely identified um, a negative thing. So that's a false negative. And then maybe you're a doctor and you say to a man, you're not pregnant, mate which is obviously be a true negative. He isn't pregnant, um, but you've identified the thing correctly. Um, and that is called a confusion matrix. It's I don't know whether it's deliberately called a confusion matrix, but it can turn out to be quite confusing, quite confusing. So here comes an example. Here comes an example, and it's customer churn example. And the reason I'm giving you this example, it's not just for fun, it is not just for fun. There's a really good reason for it. So according to the authors of Leading on the Edge of Chaos, a really good book that we should all read, a 2% increase in customer retention. So a 2% ability in, in keeping the customers we've got is equivalent to a 10% reduction in costs. Um, so a lot of companies uh, and a lot of companies that care about customers pay a lot of attention to churn analysis because they know how costly it is to get another customer in to give them the same amount of money. It's massively more cost effective to retain your customers than to allow them to leave and recruit new ones. Uh, I found that yesterday. I thought really, really interesting stat and really shows why it's super important to know why our customers leave. So a predictive churn model is a straightforward classification tool. Um, and it looks at user activity from the past to check who was active after a certain time and create a model that probabilistically identifies um, when a customer may, may well exit your service, your customer, um, your organization. So a customer churn refers to the rate of customer attrition in a company, or in simpler words, the speed at which customers leave your company or service. Um, example of customer churn, cancellation of a network Netflix subscription or an Amazon subscription or a Disney Plus subscription, or God knows how many things I'm gonna to have to pay for just to watch TV. Closure of account, non-renewal of a contract or a service agreement, decision to shop at another store, uh, the use of another service provider. Um, so I've got um, a really good example that I heard from a, um, uh, uh, an employer that we work with. So a large financial in institution. They um, extract a data set of 100,000 customers. And what they want to do is they want to predict, and um, they want to develop a model that predicts which of those customers will stay with their organization or will leave their organization. So they get 100,000 customer record data set. And they split it into two. 250,000 record data sets. Um, and the first 50,000 records, it has a variable that says whether the customer has stayed or remained. Um, the second 50,000 records, we know that the organization knows whether they've been stayed or remained, but they're going to remove that information when they give it to the algorithm. So for the first 50,000 records, they give it to the algorithm and the algorithm trains itself. It knows whether those customers have stayed or remained and it has a load of variables, age, income, gender, or anything you can think of that a bank records and they probably record a lot more than you can think of um, to make that judgment. Um, but the, the, so the, training, uh, the training data set has that key field in whether they stayed or remained. So you give the first 50,000 records, the machine learning algorithm, it does its thing, it learns. It learns when to identify whether someone has stayed or remained and it checks itself using that field. Then you give it the second 50,000 data set and you remove the field that says whether the customer stayed or remained and you get the machine learning algorithm to predict whether they stayed or remained. Bearing in mind, you know whether they did or they didn't. So once the machine learning algorithm has plowed through that second 50,000 records and come up with a decision, they remained or they stayed, um, and it develops, it develops a massive data set, 50,000 records, and adds in that label, remained or stayed. Then we can compare it to actually what happened in real life. 
And these machine, learn, machine learning algorithms are between 85 and 95% accurate at working out whether a customer is going to leave. So if you think, well, how is that important? Well, let's say the bank comes up with a new product or service or decides to massively increase overdraft fees. It can have a really good idea by doing lots of different things. How is our customer um, estate going to vary as a result of us making this change? Um, so just really, really interesting example and a, a really tactile example as well. And these machine learning algorithms are really good and better at humans at doing stuff. Clearly, a human could make a judgment about whether those customers stayed or remained. But how long would it take to make a judgment over those 50,000 records? Quite a long time, potentially. So let's have a look at one of the unsupervised learning techniques. So let's have a look at clustering. So we won't labor too much on this, but clustering is a mechanism um, for spatially um, collating records together. So most machine learning algorithms are based on probability, which is where those p-values came in when we looked at that regression output, whereas clustering isn't probability-based. It's based spatially. How close are these records to each other? So what we've got here is um, a clustering output from R Studio. Um, R is a statistical programming language, does lots of machine learning amongst a load of other statistical testing, but it comes loaded with a load of pre-installed data sets, and one of the famous ones is called MT Cars, and it is, I think, it's a load of data taken from a motoring magazine in America in 1970. And it records lots of information about cars in terms of how heavy they are, what their engine displacement is, how much horsepower they are, how quick they can do the quarter mile. Um, and so the clustering algorithm clusters those cars into groups. And it's developed three clusters, a red cluster, a blue cluster, and a green cluster. Now, if you think about um, marketing, um, and campaigns for marketing and you've got a load of customers, maybe you want to use a clustering algorithm to segment your customers into however many optimal clusters the algorithm decides. And then you can, um, you can create marketing campaigns specifically to those clusters. And I had to get some kind of crime analysis into here. So this is burglaries in Sydney over 10 years. Um, and it's using a K-means clustering algorithm to develop hotspots uh, of where burglaries occur. And then they've gone one further and they've animated those hotspots over 10 years. So you can see how crime patterns adjust over time. And particularly around here, you can see a big burst of crime. Um, I think that's a massive housing estate that was built just north of Sydney and open, which led to a big, big old bumper crime there. Um, but clustering used a lot in crime analysis, uh, used a lot, like I said, in Airbnb. Um, anything where you've got spatial data, so where do our customers reside across the UK? Let's hope they're not just aligned to population centers, which tends to be what a lot of clustering will give you. Right. Okay, so there's a, that's a lot of information. And Phoebe, remind me when we're having our na next break, just so I'm conscious of time. I've got a few slides to go, but how are we doing for time, Phoebe? Well, um, originally we were supposed to have <laughs> a break in 10 minutes. Okay. But, um, you know, if it takes a little bit, if you have a couple more slides, I think there's no harm yeah. in that. I've, you know what, I do, I have, what do I have? I have seven more slides, but I'm a bit of a bugger with slides because I tend to put one slide with a million different pictures on. So um, <laughs> I think, you know what, another 10 minutes, we probably kill them. We can get through the bulk of these slides. So okay, let's great. start talking about how, right, so we've, we've, we've kind of, we've taken the first steps into what machine learning is, where it's come from, what does it look like, what can it do? But how do we do it, right? And we've learned all the, or we've kind of had an introduction to the concepts, but how actually would we go about and do it? How would we go and do it? And just, you know what? There are lots and lots and lots of different ways to do it. Perhaps the most popular ways at the moment, um, and this may, this may kind of resonate with you guys, is Python and R. Python and R are probably predominantly the two main places to do machine learning at the moment. Bit of a weird situation with Python R. They're open source. They're entirely free. They cost absolutely no money. There are paid versions you can potentially get which do additional things. But the bulk of the software is entirely free. You can go and download it off this webinar if you want, um, straight after the webinar. <coughs> but if you did, you'd probably find out pretty quickly um, that the user interfaces are maybe not something you've been traditionally used to. The user interfaces are probably 20 years in the past. Um, and it's very much, my analytical experience is very much dragging and dropping objects and creating queries and, and very visual and very kind of data flow in its nature. Whereas R and Python are very much coding in nature. 
So they're more akin to a software developer and their type of skills, um, which makes it really, really difficult to move from a kind of data role where you predominantly haven't coded or scripted. And you know what? Most roles in the UK probably have no coding, software coding or scripting whatsoever. Um, and to move into a role where it's predominantly coding and scripting is a very, very difficult thing to navigate. Um, and, and particularly if you just were to download R and Python on their own, um, you probably struggle initially with the user interface and the user interface will put probably 70% of people off ever using it, I would imagine, because that's certainly certainly the experience I had. I loaded up Python and R for the first time and I was like, why, why are we cave people? Why have we gone back 30 years? I don't understand that. And the reason is, is one, because they're free, two, because they can handle much larger volumes than most of the software tools we have at work, um, and three, because they can do machine learning, and there aren't many software tools within our organizations that can do it. They are coming online, they are definitely coming online, um, but they're not quite there yet. So if you did want to get into this machine learning space and you, you've kind of listened to what I'm saying in terms of scripting isn't really your flavor and you might find that difficult to get on board with and you like a tool that's got a decent user interface, Anaconda may well be the place to go. So Anaconda is a free and open source distribution of Python and R as well both those programming languages for scientific computing. And I suppose if machine learning is within data science, so scientific computing is exactly where we want to be. And it aims to simplify package man management and deployment. Um, so it's basically, it's kind of wrapping up Python and R into a much better user interface. And so Anaconda Navigator is the desktop graphical user interface, the GUI, um, which in, is included in the An Anaconda distribution that allows you to launch applications easily, manage uh, packages and environments and channels without using command line commands. And command line commands is effectively typing in, into a computer do this, open this Excel spreadsheet using this package and remove the final column. Well, it's a bit old hat. Typing stuff out to make computers do stuff does feel a bit 30 years ago. Um, and so that's why Anaconda Navigator is a really cool place to be. So it's got a really nice user interface and you can see the user interface here. Um, and some of the things you may well be familiar with and some of the things you might not be familiar with. So we kind of go through them sequentially, Jupyter Notebooks. So Python is a programming language and R is a programming language. Now the programming languages on their own are not much cop. It's like having the engine of a car, but without any windows, doors, steering wheel, windscreens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not much cop on its own. And, and that's why um, software developers have what are called integrated development environments. And integrated development environments are like having a car with an engine and some wheels and some uh, windscreen wipers and a windshield and some doors and stuff like that. It helps you use that programming language much more effectively if you were, used it, you were to use it on, on your own. Um, so Python um, has lots and lots of integrated development environments. Jupyter Notebooks is one of the primary ones. It's probably if you were to start getting um, upskilling around Python and machine learning, the chances of you not coming across Jupyter Notebooks are pretty slim to none. So Jupyter Notebooks is an integrated development environment that, um, are based on Python. Uh, it actually does it in, its, in a browser. It will operate in a Chrome browser as well, which is absolutely frightening. Spider is another integrated development environment for Python, but it's predominantly for scientific research. So a lot of scientists, a lot of academics use it. Orange 3 is right up my street. So that is machine learning. Machine learning, but for people that like to drag and drop stuff and not like to type out code. And I'll show you Orange Tree in a bit. And then we have R Studio, my favorite little statistical programming tool. Um, that's the one I first learned when I was on my kind of path of machine learning. I found it incredibly difficult, um, but it was, it was iterative. It's like a drip drip thing. Um, and eventually those drips can um, create some kind of environment and contextual environment that you can understand and use. So I'm a big fan of R Studio, um, but I'm a big fan of Python as well. So Jupyter Notebooks, integrated development environment for Python. We're not going to go too in depth here, but just frighteningly, you can run machine learning in a Chrome browser. Oh my God, how impressive is that? So a, a Jupyter Notebooks is all run from a browser, so not a huge amount to install. The, the command line that you would see where you would type script in kind of looks like this. Um, you can type lots and lots of code in. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at, a, again, another sports data set, an MBA data set this time. I want to do some clustering. 
Um, I want to do some linear regression. I want to do a random forest as well. And I can do that all within Jupyter Notebooks um, or predicated on Python. And I can start to generate some analytical outputs as well, which is really cool. And all within a browser, all within a browser. Thank God for Chrome. Thank God for Chrome. What might be a little bit easier and maybe a bit of a better vehicle to enter into the area of machine learning is Orange 3. So Orange 3 is a much, 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 super, uh, much, much more simpler interface. If R and Python on their own are incredibly complex in terms of their interface, an Anaconda Navigator is a bit of a bridge. Orange is completely the different direction in terms of usability. So this is what Orange looks like. Orange has um, a kind of a bit of a widget on the left here, and it has a big old blank screen. And the idea is, is to drag and drop widgets into the big white screen. So I'm going to, what I've done is I've created a linear regression model here using a really interesting data set. Um, called petal widths and sepal widths. It's basically analysis of plants um, and how different sizes of petal widths can be clustered and correlated together. Super, super interesting. Um, but the way Orange 3 does it is you drag widgets. So you drag a file widget into the window um, and you basically double click the file widget and you um, line it up to a data set. And then if you wanted to do a scatter plot, you would take a scatter plot widget and you drag it onto the, the main kind of canvas and you would drag a data flow between the scatter plot. You would double click on the scatter plot widget, set some of the, the conditions in what kind of, uh, which uh, variables you want on what axis. Um, but trust me, if you've come from a position of trying to code into either R Studio or Python, moving to something like Orange 3 feels much, much more like modern software, not like software from 30 years ago. Um, Commercial entry into this machine learning world is probably going to look more like Orange 3 than it is going to look like R and Python. Um, but that world has not yet been strictly defined yet, so it could kind of look like anything. Right. So, Kaggle. Kaggle's where I got that FIFA 18 data set from. Kaggle provided me an avocado data set as well, which thankfully I did not use in today's sprint, and you'll be glad to know about that. There's not much interest you can generate from an avocado data set. But if you're serious about machine learning, Kaggle is a, the place you should be, the absolute place you should be. So it's a website, and it kind of not only does it um, co locate data sets, it brings together a community, and it also has competitions as well. So it's a kind of machine learning website. You can go on there, you can get data, you can enter competitions. Those competitions might be, we'll see in a couple, we'll see a couple in a second, in fact, on the next slide. Those competitions might be big ticket items like improve the passenger screening algorithms of the Home Department of Homeland Security in America with a $1.5 million prize at the end if you do the best algorithm. And so all of these competitions are for people to go and design machine learning algorithms to do stuff. So Zestimate, I would imagine that's similar to Zoopla. So how does Zoopla estimate house prices? There's probably some seriously complex algorithms in the background. Um, how can they be improved? Well, actually, maybe you could get citizen data scientists in 40, across 1,425 teams to create algorithms which improve Zillow's ability to predict house prices into the future. It's a 1.2 million pound prize or dollar prize at the end of that. Understanding the Amazon from space. So the Amazon is, is often referred to as the lungs of the world. So we probably need to have a handle about what the state of the lungs are in the world. Um, maybe we need to grow a new pair of lungs in a different country at some stage, but we probably need to understand how our lungs are doing at the minute. And you know what, maybe that's a reflection of where humanity is placed at the minute. Fundamental element to uh, humans having long-term sustainability on the planet, 60,000 pounds. Um, stop humans flying when they shouldn't fly 1.5 million pounds and maybe there's a bit of a representation in terms of where we're focusing our analytical data machine learning efforts um, but Kaggle really really good place really good um, really good community so you can um, create machine learning algorithms you can upload what are called kernels to the which are effectively the script of your machine learning algorithm people will comment on them people might use them for for little bits of their machine learning algorithms there are lots of forums to help you develop your, your learning algorithms etc 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 if you want a place to go to start your machine learning career or your data science career in anger Kaggle is definitely the place to go. Um, reality is a lot of data science CVs don't look like CVs that we're traditionally used to. Those CVs, a lot of the times, are predicated on Kaggle compositions. So here's a link to a Kaggle competition proving I've done data science, proving how accurate my model is. A completely different way of looking 
at going for jobs in kind of the new world. And that's just proof. I didn't just um, steal the FIFA 18 data set from an EA server. Um, they happily gave it to Kaggle so that lots of people could conduct machine learning and learn about it um, on that. So I think I've only got a couple of slides to go. You'd be pleased to know and we can kind of have a little bit of a pause and get onto a QA and a session. But where does machine, how does machine learning help me in my life? Ooh, oh God, I don't know what I did there. Why is everything on blank? <laughs> I pressed the wrong key. How, what practical uses are there for machine learning? There are loads of practical uses. So we probably got some kind of virtual personal assistant. And at this stage, that's a Google Home or the latest version, but I can't not show an, uh, an Amazon Alexa or a Hey Siri. And at that stage, I thought, well, I could do Cortana. There could be a million ones to do. So I stopped there. So any of those kind of virtual personal assistants are predicated on machine learning. So they're taking your language um, and they're using what you say to them to try and help them become more effective at learning language into the future. So it's machine learning that underpins all of our personal assistants. If you ever use Google Maps and you've signed up to Google Maps, um, you've inadvertently allowed Google to figure out whether you're stationary on a road or not. And, where, and whether you're stationary on a road or not can indicate what the traffic's like as well. So there's machine learning algorithms in terms of predicting traffic patterns and predicting which the best route is to take to get from one place to another. Facial recognition out of crowds, really controversial topic at the minute. I have my own very personal, very, very personal and specific opinions on it. I think we should use this type of stuff. Had we used facial recognition, the Manchester Arena bomber probably would have got nowhere near the Manchester Arena to do what he did. Um, but there were a lot of privacy considerations that as, um, as the UK and as society, we need to understand and overcome. So facial recognition is super important. Um, you're wanting to estimate, I don't know, how many people in a protest are going to approach the police lines. And so do we need to bolster those police lines to protect life, liberty, and property? So facial recognition and density detection can help us do that through machine learning. Facial recognition within Facebook, um, tagging pictures for us uh, without us having to tell who the picture is. Um, and there's Zuck, and hopefully he's had some facial recognition done to him, because it'd be nice for it to be done to him rather than to be done for everyone else. Spam classification. We probably had spam filters in emails for about 15 years now, but they're using machine learning. And the reason they're using machine learning is because the spammers are constantly adjusting the nature of spam emails. And so what happens is an email goes into a machine learning algorithm, machine learning algorithm classes it as spam or not spam. If it's spam, into the spam folder. If it's not spam, into your inbox. Um, but you constantly have to give it updated uh, information. It, it will be a supervised learning algorithm because the, the spammers will learn how the algorithm is identifying their emails as spam. And they'll create emails that the algorithm does not identify as spam. And they will initially get through, but the, the, the algorithm will be trained with those new type of emails. They'll be able to identify them. And it's just a cyclical game of creating emails looking slightly different to get through spam filters to then be stopped getting through spam filters. Chat box. Oh, I love a chat bot. I imagine all you guys do as well. Chat bots are there to help. They should be there to help direct us efficiently and speedily um, to a resolution. Are they either efficient or speedy? Not in my experience at the moment, but chat bots are predicated on machine learning using natural language processing, trying to work out what you type in text. What do you actually want? What do you want us to do? Um, search engine optimization and Google um, recommendations. So machine learning is predicated in terms of how you display search engine results to you, making the search engine results much more relevant to you, how you respond to those results. So if you put a search term in and you don't click any of the first 10 links, then that search um, results probably weren't best ever for you. And actually Google want to know that and want to create them and make those search engine results better for you. Recommendations on Amazon. Um, so Amazon has got machine learning algorithms in the background that know when you buy Toby the robot, you may also be interested in Temi, the smart interactive robot puppy, which responds to touch, walking, singing, and telling stuff. Um, should you want those additional recommendations? I don't need those recommendations, Amazon. I know what I want to buy. Don't need you to suggest other things for me unless it's out of stock. So artificial general intelligence. Ah, uh, this is a little bit of a tricky one. So the technologies that we've discussed are probably examples of artificial narrow intelligence, which can effectively perform a narrow defined task, classify that picture as a lion, or interpret this text as what I want you to do in terms of a chatbot. 
Um, meanwhile, we're continuing to make foundational, and it's important to highlight that word, foundational advances towards human level artificial general intelligence. And that is also known as strong AI. The definition of artificial general intelligence is an AI that can successfully perform any intellectual task that a human being can, including learning, planning, decision making under uncertainty, communicating in natural language, making jokes, manipulating people, trading stocks, reprogramming, reprogramming itself. But that might give us a little bit of a concern because an ultra intelligent machine um, can be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual, intellectual activities of any person, however clever they are. So since the design of a machine is one of, since designing of machines is one of those intellectual activities that an ultra intelligent machine will do, an ultra intelligent machine could then design better machines. And then there would be an unquestionably a huge explosion in intelligence. And the intelligence of humans would be left way far behind. And it's becoming a bit Terminator, but I think we can, we can probably avoid Skynet if we're really smart about it. So the first ultra intelligent machine that humans develop is the last invention we'll ever make. Because every invention that that machine makes their own will be much better than we could ever do. Um, so we need to be super, super cautious about this. Super, super cautious. And I think it's fundamentally important to say that AI and machine learning are going to have a transformational change in terms of humanity. And let's, you know what, let's hope that it's going to be for the best. But we don't work on hope. What we need to do as a society is fundamentally upskill our knowledge around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Because if we don't, then our governments will not be able to legislate for it. And whilst legislation might be a constraining thing, I think because of the nature of this, uh, of this technology, it can be used for nefarious ways. And so we need our politicians to be able to understand this stuff, to legislate for it, to make sure it's used in the best way for human society and not for nefarious ways. And so that's partly why we're kind of, one of the reasons why we're here in, that, in this sprint is not only to get kind of an introductory knowledge to machine learning, but that wider piece of, if we don't understand it, we can't control it. And if we can't control it, we could end up in the Terminator scenario. I very much doubt that we will, but we need to globally increase our knowledge of machine learning so that we can control it because not controlling it could be a, an utter disaster and could lead to a lot of poor outcomes for a lot of people, a lot of poor outcomes for a lot of people. Right, so very quickly, we're just going to tip onto kind of the final slide before we break for a 10 minute break and then have a bit of question and answer at the end. Just a little bit of a look towards what some of the future might look like. So we're kind of already looking at the future, but there's no harm in looking at the future of the future of the future. Um, and so Gartner is a really good organization um, that brings together a lot of uh, research and analysis across IT, across science, across a lot of places with, uh, across the globe and tries to figure out what are kind of the new growth areas um, and the top kind of trends in data analytics augmented analytics is a big one um, so automating findings and servicing the most important insights or changes in the business to optimize decision making effectively that's taking my job and giving it to a robot so why not might not be hugely into that might not be hugely into that there's augmented data management so with technical skills in really short supply which hopefully we're trying to bolster and actively doing that and data growing exponentially organizations need to automate data management tasks vendors are adding machine learning and artificial capabilities to make data managing processes self-configuring and self-tuning so actually the really frustrating part of data science in terms of cleansing data machine learning can help us cleanse data as well Natural language processing um, and conversational analytics are going to become a big thing as well. So just as search interfaces like Google make the internet accessible to everyday consumers, natural language processing gives businesses an easier way to ask questions about data and receive an explanation of the insights. Conversational analytics, on the other hand, um, takes the concepts of natural language processing a little further. And it allows you to ask a question verbally, not through text, and to receive a verbal answer as well. Um, Conversational analytics is likely to boost business intelligence by 35 to 50% over the next four and five years. So could be a huge, a huge growth area. Graph analytics um, based on the pole mnemonic, person, object, location, and event. Big increasing area, um, one that the police have been using for a long old time, but the machine learning algorithms which apply to graph analytic databases are only just coming online now. Um, so graph analytics is, is um, projected to be a big, a big old place as well. Commercial AI and machine learning um, 
moving away from those open source platforms so moving away from python and r clearly going to be a big driver for growth in the future data fabric as well so delivering value from analytical investments depending depends on having agile and trusted data fabric so the architecture of your data within your organizations is going to become data fabric much more fluid much more able to be integrated um, and transformed and then explainable ai so that, um, that is AI that increases the transparency and trustworthiness of AI solutions. That key point I was making in terms of if we don't know about AI and machine learning, how can we legislate for it? How can we control it for the better use of humans, uh, for humanity? So a explainable AI is a set of capabilities that describes a model, highlights its strengths and weaknesses, predicts its likely behavior, and identifies any potential biases as well, which is going to be a really important thing. Blockchain technology, clearly an important thing for kind of cryptocurrency and, and suggested to be the next big boom within all of business and all and it was going to take over the world. And it kind of hasn't taken over the world quite as yet. Um, but it's going to be the marriage of blockchain um, capabilities with existing capabilities. That's where the real bounce is going to be. Um, and then two final ones, continuous intelligence. So organizations um, have long sought real-time intelligence and systems are available to do this for a limited set of tasks. But now it's finally impractical. It's finally practical to implement these systems across every single data set that your company has, much broader scale. And that's because of the advances in cloud technology, the growth of the internet of things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there may be a really, really fundamental and a bit of a techie kind of development in the data analytics space is persistent memory servers. And so persistent memory servers are effectively memory um, that it returns, writes information and reads information much, much, much more quicker than any kind of memory um, storage capability at the, at the minute can. And if you think with the birth of the internet, or not the birth of the internet, the growth of the internet, and the speed at which transactions are coming, and the speed at which organizations will need to adjust to those, that new data and new insights, actually, um, with huge efficiency gains can be gained by writing data storage, storage systems or repositories 50% um, quicker than was traditionally done. Currently, it's kind of, it's microseconds, but they're looking to read and write data in nanoseconds. Um, so 10 to the minus nine of a second type of thing. So the ability to read and write data is going to fundamentally change as well. And you know what? I probably had enough from me for today. So um, that's all the slides that I have. Um, and so I think now, Phoebe, it's probably probably time just for me to sit down and breathe for a second. Um, <laughs> give everyone the chance for a kind of a 10 minute break, a re-lubrication with a brew. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And then back for a Q&A session. Yeah, I think what we'll do instead of a full 10, I think hmm. we'll just do a five. Okay, cool. So if everyone could be back by 11, uh, 11.49, 11.50, and we'll hmm. get started then. And then... Um, because it's not a it's it's not a full twenty minutes. Um, everyone, just so you know, you can always email us at sprint at firebrandtraining dot com for any um, any other questions that come off the top of your head over the weekend, maybe. Um, and yeah, so we'll be back at should we say eleven fifty? Eleven fifty sounds like yeah. a plan. See everyone okay, back at eleven fifty. See you all at eleven fifty.
Okay, so we're creeping towards 11.50. I'm just now I've figured out where the chat box resides, which is good for me <laughs> because it, I was so easily distracted. <laughs> oh, I'll stop talking about that. We can talk about iNaturalist, which Charles is saying is an app that uses image recognition really well to identify birds, animals, plants, and insects uses the image bank. And data points showing the range of occurrence of plants, birds to suggest the animal is based upon supply from. Mm, yeah, exactly that. Oh, well, thank you, Al. I appreciate that. But yeah, um, I don't know whether you kind of want to kick off the Q&A session, Phoebe, or we'll just open up. Well, the Q&A session is open up for questions now. Cool. So if anyone would like to pop, it, pop their questions in the chat box, uh, they're welcome to do so. Um, uh, in the meantime, is there, are there any specific data related courses that you would recommend uh, if you're interested in getting into machine learning? Mm, there are, uh, you know what, the, the, the kind of space and around data training isn't, it's, no, it's not as formal or as structured as maybe cybersecurity or networking or something like that. There's not, there's no one certification that a data analyst kind of must have or a machine learning engineer must have. Um, I suppose it depends where, depends where your knowledge level is at um, and kind of what your background is. If your background is in statistics and maths, then you could probably enter into machine learning at a slightly higher level. But if it's like me and it isn't kind of statistics and maths, you might have to enter it at a slightly lower level. Um, I did a I did a really good course called the, uh, the a data science associate course with Dell EMC a couple of years back, and that gave me some really good. It gave me that really good conceptual understanding about all of those algorithms in, in a lot more depth um, that we've kind of been through today and how they're kind of how they're developed, where they've come from, what are the values you need to interpret, what are the dangers in terms of some um, algorithms are more applicable than others. So it's a bit tricky. You know what the main vehicle for me would be is kind of LinkedIn would be a really good vehicle. Um, so yeah, there aren't really many formal trying to training courses. So to a certain extent, a lot of it is self-teaching. Um, but the the area of data science online in terms of self-teaching stuff is absolutely phenomenal. There's so much online resource out there. You add into that kind of Kaggle um, where they give you data sets and challenge you to come up with um, better machine learning algorithms. So quite a famous one is the Titanic data set where obviously we, we, we know about the Titanic, we know all the people that were on the Titanic and we know the people that died and survived. And so there's quite, a, there's famous machine learning algorithms which predict who died and survived. And um, it's quite easy to do that because it was men, it was women and children, women and children and, and rich people, basically the people that survived on the Titanic. So you can use a machine learning algorithm knowing what um, the gender of the individual was, how old they were, what position, they were in the boat, so were they in first class or second class, or God knows how many classes they were. Um, so there's loads of famous examples of people trying to predict who died and survived off the Titanic, and that's all kind of limp, uh, kind of um, rounded up in that Kaggle website. So Kaggle would be kind of my main place to go to get familiar with data sets, kind of to start off with. Um, th there are some courses out there, and I know that Firebrand are actively looking to kind of increase our portfolio around this, and we're waiting for Microsoft and other kind of big ticket organizations to kind of formalize their data analytics and machine learning provisions. Um, but clearly there's a, there's a huge growth area, but the, you know what the training, like I said, there isn't one certification that if I'm interviewing a data science, they must have that. It isn't, it doesn't look like that, which is kind of why I said that, that thing in terms of um, CVs for data scientists look much more like Kaggle, um, Kaggle competitions rather than traditional CVs. Anyone with any other questions? You may well have figured out, I do like the sound of my own voice. So I'm not afraid to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you may well have figured that out. Um, it, oh, but you know what another good vehicle would be? You know what another good vehicle would be? Say you weren't, um, say you didn't want to be as specific as a machine learning engineer or something like that, but you did want to increase your broader data skills. Um, there are lots of really, there's a good, really good data analytics apprenticeship 
um, within uh, within apprenticeships at the moment. And for those that don't know apprenticeships, the government had a really good idea, and they every organisation in the UK with more than a three million pound wage bill, um, they tax them 0.5 percent of that entire wage bill. And for some of the larger organisations in the UK, that's like 15 million quid a year. And if you don't spend that money in two years, the tre treasury take it off you, and that money can only be spent on developing um, new and significant skills and learning. Um, and actually, there are really good data analytics courses built into our apprenticeship program, um, and you get them for free. You, the, the actual student, the learner, the apprentice pays absolutely nothing for them. And level four is equivalent to an HND, HNC, first year of a degree. Uh, and if you compare well, um, being in a job getting paid and getting trained to an HND, HNC equivalent, um, and I paid nothing for it compared to potentially paying £16,000 a year. Are we using machine learning for COVID spread in the UK? Oh, you know what? I would I would hope that we are, but given that they decided to record critical um, COVID relation uh, COVID information on an Excel spreadsheet, um, I would doubt. <laughs> you know what? It probably is happening in pockets, probably around kind of red brick universities in the UK. So I'd be very surprised if data scientists within Oxford, Cambridge, the Manchester universities, uh, I don't want to miss out any, so I, I can't recall the five red bricks at the minute. I'd be very surprised if there isn't work in and around that going on. Is there a federated approach within the NHS to using machine learning for COVID spread in the UK? I would doubt. I would doubt. I, there should be. There totally should be. But there probably isn't the wealth of knowledge um, within the UK at the minute to really carry that stuff out. And that is, that's kind of partly to do with the way that we manage people in the UK. Managers in the UK are incredibly geared towards supporting members of staff. Um, and so you will ask a member of staff to do something and they might not be able to do it. And so you'll support them in doing it. Um, but then you may say you come across an area which you don't have any knowledge in, maybe machine learning. Would you then ask a member of staff to do a machine learning algorithm, knowing that you could never support them in the production of that algorithm? And maybe that is one of the reasons, and generally these things, certainly on a macro level, there isn't just one reason why machine learning isn't taking off as quickly as it should do. But one of the reasons are our bosses don't understand it. And if they don't understand it, they don't feel empowered to support us in developing it. And ergo, those questions stop. They don't progress. I don't hear my bosses saying, what's the receiver operating? What are the number of true positives from this classification algorithm, Sean? Whereas that's totally the type of question they should be asking. What's the inherent bias in here? Where's this algorithm come from? How has it been developed? What mathematical principles is it based on? People don't in the UK generally don't have, have that level of knowledge, one, to ask that question, and two, if they got an answer, to contextualize and use it. And that's why, that's why I'm so passionate about this, not only for making sure we legislate for AI and, A and ML use in the future, but this is never going to take off in our country unless we get a wealth of people with that knowledge. And eventually, we'll all move into management positions. And the questions we ask of our members of staff because of our exposure to this type of stuff will change. And we will start to see the introduction of machine learning um, across most businesses. And I've always thought, um, I've always asked myself in every organization I've worked in, how could, will I have used machine learning? And you totally can do. So just thinking of for Firebrand, um, we could do a machine learning classification model that would work out whether someone's going to pass or fail an exam. And if we, we can predict they're going to fail, then we can intervene. We can put much more intervention into that individual to turn them from a failure to a pass. Um, so there's, there's inherent applications. Fundamentally, it will probably re require a fundamental change in the way we record and process data, which tends to be the biggest sticking point, I think. Is it worth doing a degree apprenticeship in data science or is it better to graduate in maths and specialise later? Oh, what that is a really good question. Um, uh, it depends what your um, propensity for debt is, <laughs> I would imagine. A data, if you're going to do... A maths degree, um, oh, that's going to be three years at least, and, and maybe more. And you know, you're looking, you're looking at nearly a hundred thousand pounds worth of debt. Whereas you can totally, you can do a degree apprenticeship and get exactly that same level of qualification, and you paid nothing for it. In fact, you've been paid to get it. Any idea why uh, slow wide uptake for such obvious applications of COVID related around giving all these? I think, yeah, it's, it's that thing I was saying before, Adam, it's around our bosses don't understand it. And so they won't ask us because they're in no place to support us. And my view is that our management structure in the UK or methodology is predicated on supporting people. 
So that's why it's, you know what, it's not easy. It is very, very difficult to understand. I, I don't know what the, the number of people that are done A-level maths in the country. Oh God, I'd have to guess. It's got to be less than 10%, hasn't it? And you fundamentally need a really good mathematical knowledge to be able to really be proficient in this type of, in this type of world. And I was lucky I'd only ever did GCSE maths and I wish I'd done A-level maths, but I kind of had that uh, built into my degree to a certain extent. So chemistry was quite mathematical to a certain extent. So I gained that additional mathematical knowledge to help me with this kind of machine learning piece. Charles is saying there have been uh, online conferences on data science of COVID research. I've seen several of events advertised on Eventbrite such as this one. Well, that's a good shout, Charles. So if you were interested in how machine learning may well help COVID, um, it's there. I mean, how could it? Well, you know, we could use machine learning to predict whether people would get long COVID or not, couldn't you? So of all the people that got COVID, um, there's going to be a pattern in terms of the, one that get, the ones that get those um, really debilitating long-term um, kind of issues with COVID. So if we can identify what leads people to be getting it. Not only can we identify the people that are going to get it and help them out, we can maybe put some preventative actions in, in there. It might be just one nugget of information that if you don't do this, you're not going to get long COVID. So make a choice. Try not to do it. Thank you, Clive. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Glad th you enjoyed it. I think on that note, it's 12 o'clock. So I think we're going to end the session. Um, Sean, thank you so, so much for a brilliant webinar. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> thank um, you. I hope everyone really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, since there's been some really good feedback. Um, everyone, you'll be receiving a copy of the recording of today's webinar um shortly uh, in a follow-up email um, if you have any questions you can always email us at sprint at firebrandtraining.com um, and please check out for any other webinars that may be of interest to you for the rest of the year thanks again sean and no everyone have a lovely weekend oh, and if you do stick it on youtube make sure i get the advertising revenue Thank you. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that six pence will come in a lot of use. Bye team, thank you. Thanks a lot.